Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter Thirty Two. Dark Places. The dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. Psalms seventy four twenty. Trailing wearily behind a rude wagon and over a ruder road, Tom and his associates faced onward. In the wagon was seated Simon Legree, and the two women, still fettered together, were stowed away with some baggage in the back part of it, and the whole company were seeking Legree's plantation, which lay a good distance off. It was a wild, forsaken road, now winding through dreary pine barrens where the wind whispered mournfully, and now over log causeways through long cypress swamps, the doleful trees rising out of the slimy, spongy ground, hung with long wreaths of funereal black moss, while ever and anon the loathsome form of the moccasin snake might be seen sliding among broken stumps and shattered branches that lay here and there rotting in the water. It is disconsolate enough, this riding to the stranger, who, with well-filled pocket and well-appointed horse, threads the lonely way on some errand of business, but wilder, drearier to the man enthralled, whom every weary step bears further from all that man loves and prays for. So one should have thought, that witnessed the sunken and dejected expression on those dark faces, the wistful, patient weariness with which those sad eyes rested on object after object that passed them in their sad journey. Simon rode on, however, apparently well pleased, occasionally pulling away at a flask of spirit, which he kept in his pocket. "'I say you,' he said, as he turned back and caught a glance of the dispirited faces behind him. "'Strike up a song, boys! Come!' The men looked at each other, and the come was repeated with a smart crack of the whip which the driver carried in his hands. Tom began a Methodist hymn. "'Jerusalem, my happy home, name ever dear to me, when shall my sorrows have an end, thy joys, when shall... Note. Jerusalem, my happy home, anonymous hymn dating from the latter part of the sixteenth century, sung to the tune of St. Stephen, words derived from St. Augustine's meditations. "'Shut up, you black cuss!' roared Legree. "'Did you think I wanted any of your infernal old Methodism? I say, tune up now, and something real rowdy, quick!' One of the other men struck up one of those unmeaning songs common among the slaves. Massa seed me caught a coon, hi, boys, hi! He laughed to split to see the moon, ho, 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 boys, ho! Ho, yo, hi, ye, ho! The singer appeared to make up the song to his own pleasure, generally hitting on rhyme, without much attempt at reason, and the party took up the chorus at intervals. Ho, 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 boys, ho! Hi, ye, ho! Hi, ye, ho! It was sung very boisterously, and with a forced attempt at merriment but no wail of despair, no words of impassioned prayer could have had such a depth of woe in them as the wild notes of the chorus, as if the poor, dumb heart, threatened, prisoned, took refuge in that inarticulate sanctuary of music, and found there a language in which to breathe its prayer to God. There was a prayer in it which Simon could not hear. He only heard the boys singing noisily, and was well pleased. He was making them keep up their spirits. "'Well, my little dear,' he said, turning to Emmeline, and laying his hands on her shoulder, "'we're almost home.' When Legree scolded and stormed, Emmeline was terrified. But when he laid his hand on her, and spoke as he now did, she felt as if she had rather he would strike her. The expression of his eye made her soul sick and her flesh creep. Involuntarily she clung closer to the mulatto woman by her side, as if she were her mother. "'You didn't ever wear earrings,' he said, taking hold of her small ear with his coarse fingers. "'No, massa,' said Emmeline, trembling and looking down. "'Well, I'll give you a pair, when we get home, if you're a good girl. You needn't be so frightened. I don't mean to make you work very hard. You'll have fine times with me, and live like a lady, only be a good girl.' Legree had been drinking to that degree that he was inclined to be very gracious, and it was about this time that the enclosures of the plantation rose to view. The estate had formerly belonged to a gentleman of opulence and taste, who had bestowed some considerable attention to the adornment of his grounds. Having died insolvent, it had been purchased at a bargain by Legree, who used it, as he did everything else, merely as an implement for money-making. The place had that ragged, forlorn appearance, which is always produced by the evidence that the care of the former owner has been left to go to utter decay. 
What was once a smooth-shaven lawn before the house, dotted here and there with ornamental shrubs, was now covered with frowsy tangled grass, with horse-posts set up here and there in it, where the turf was stamped away, and the ground littered with broken pails, cobs of corn, and other slovenly remains. Here and there a mildewed jessamine or honeysuckle hung raggedly from some ornamental support, which had been pushed to one side by being used as a horse-post. What once was a large garden was now all grown over with weeds, through which here and there some solitary exotic reared its forsaken head. What had been a conservatory had now no window-shades, and on the mouldering shelves stood some dry, forsaken flower-pots with sticks in them, whose dried leaves showed they had once been plants. The wagon rolled up a weedy gravel-walk under a noble avenue of china-trees, whose graceful forms and ever-springing foliage seemed to be the only things there that neglect could not daunt or alter. Like noble spirits, so deeply rooted in goodness as to flourish and grow stronger amid discouragement and decay. The house had been large and handsome. It was built in a manner common at the South, a wide veranda of two stories running round every part of the house, into which every outer door opened, the lower tier being supported by brick pillars. But the place looked desolate and uncomfortable, some windows stopped up with boards, some with shattered panes, and shutters hanging by a single hinge, all telling of coarse neglect and discomfort. Bits of board, straw, old decayed barrels and boxes garnished the ground in all directions, and three or four ferocious-looking dogs, roused by the sound of the wagon-wheels, came tearing out, and were with difficulty restrained from laying hold of Tom and his companions by the effort of the ragged servants who came after them. "'You see what you'd get?' said Legree, caressing the dogs with grim satisfaction, and turning to Tom and his companions. "'You see what you'd get if you'd try to run off. These here dogs has been raised to track niggers, and they'd just as soon chaw one on you up as eat their dinner. So mind yourselves. How now, Sambo?' he said to a ragged fellow, without any brim to his hat, who was officious in his attentions. "'How have things been going?' First rate massa. "'Quimbo,' said Legree to another, who was making zealous demonstrations to attract his attention, "'you mindin' what I tell you? Guess I did, didn't I?' These two colored men were the two principal hands on the plantation. Legree had trained them in savageness and brutality as systematically as he had his bulldogs, and, by long practice in hardness and cruelty, brought their whole nature to about the same range of capacities. It is a common remark, and one that is thought to militate strongly against the character of the race, that the negro overseer is always more tyrannical and cruel than the white one. This is simply saying that the negro mind has been more crushed and debased than the white. It is no more true of this race than of every oppressed race the world over. The slave is always a tyrant, if he can get a chance to be one. Legree, like some potentates we read of in history, governed his plantation by a sort of resolution of forces. Sambo and Quimbo cordially hated each other, the plantation hands, one and all, cordially hated them, and, by playing off one against another, he was pretty sure, through one or the other of the three parties, to get informed of whatever was on foot in the place. Nobody can live entirely without social intercourse, and Legree encouraged his two black satellites to a kind of coarse familiarity with him, a familiarity, however, at any moment liable to get one or the other of them into trouble, for, on the slightest provocation, one of them always stood ready, at a nod, to be a minister of his vengeance on the other. As they stood there now by Legree, they seemed an apt illustration of the fact that brutal men are lower even than animals. Their coarse, dark, heavy features, their great eyes rolling enviously on each other, their barbarous, guttural, half-brute intonation, their dilapidated garments fluttering in the wind, were all in admirable keeping with the vile and unwholesome character of everything about the place. "'Here, you Sambo,' said Legree, "'take these yar boys down to the quarters, and here's a gal I got for you,' said he, as he separated the mulatto woman from Emmeline, and pushed her towards him. "'I promised to bring you one, you know.' The woman gave a start, and, drawing back, said suddenly, "'Oh, Massa, I left my old man in New Orleans.' "'What of that, you? Won't you want one here? None of your words. Go along,' said Legree, raising his whip. "'Come, mistress,' he said to Emmeline. "'You go in here with me.' A dark, wild face was seen, for a moment, 
to glance at the window of the house, and as Legree opened the door, a female voice said something in a quick, imperative tone. Tom, who was looking with anxious interest after Emmeline as she went in, noticed this, and heard Legree answer angrily, "'You may hold your tongue. I'll do as I please for all you.' Tom heard no more, for he was soon following Sambo to the quarters. The quarters was a little sort of street of rude shanties in a row in a part of the plantation far off from the house. They had a forlorn, brutal, forsaken air. Tom's heart sunk when he saw them. He had been comforting himself with the thought of a cottage, rude indeed, but one which he might make neat and quiet, and where he might have a shelf for his Bible, and a place to be alone out of his laboring hours. He looked into several. They were mere rude shells, destitute of any species of furniture, except a heap of straw, foul with dirt, spread confusedly over the floor, which was merely the bare ground, trodden hard by the tramping of innumerable feet. "'Which of these will be mine?' said he to Sambo, submissively. "'Dunno. Can turn in here, I suppose,' said Sambo. "'Specs there's room for another lar. There's a pretty smart heap of niggers to each on em now. Sure, I don't know what I's to do with more.' It was late in the evening when the weary occupants of the shanties came flocking home, men and women in soiled and tattered garments, surly and uncomfortable, and in no mood to look pleasantly on newcomers. The small village was alive with no inviting sounds. Hoarse, guttural voices contending at the hand-mills, where their morsel of hard corn was yet to be ground into meal, to fit it for the cake that was to constitute their only supper. From the earliest dawn of the day they had been in the fields, pressed to work under the driving lash of the overseers, for it was now in the very heat and hurry of the season, and no means was left untried to press every one up to the top of their capabilities. True, says the negligent lounger, picking cotton isn't hard work, isn't it? And it isn't much inconvenience, either, to have one drop of water fall on your head, yet the worst torture of the Inquisition is produced by drop after drop, drop after drop, falling moment after moment, with monotonous succession on the same spot. And work, in itself not hard, becomes so by being pressed, hour after hour, with unvarying, unrelenting sameness, with not even the consciousness of free will to take from its tediousness. Tom looked in vain among the gang, as they poured along, for companionable faces. He saw only sullen, scowling, imbruted men, and feeble, discouraged women, or women that were not women, the strong pushing away the weak, the gross, unrestricted animal selfishness of human beings, of whom nothing good was expected and desired, and who, treated in every way like brutes, had sunk as nearly to their level as it was possible for human beings to do. To a late hour in the night the sound of the grinding was protracted, for the mills were few in number compared with the grinders, and the weary and feeble ones were driven back by the strong, and came on last in their turn. "'Ho, oh, yo!' said Sambo, coming to the mulatto woman, and throwing down a bag of corn before her. "'What a cuss your name?' "'Lucy,' said the woman. "'Well, Lucy, you my woman now. You'll grind as our corn and get my supper baked, yeah?' "'I ain't your woman, and I won't be,' said the woman, with her sharp, sudden courage of despair. "'You go long!' "'I'll kick you, then,' said Sambo, raising his foot threateningly. "'You may kill me, if you choose. The sooner the better. Wished I was dead,' said she. "'I say, Sambo, you go to spine in the hands. I'll tell mass on you,' said Quimbo, who was busy at the mill, from which he had viciously driven two or three tired women who were waiting to grind their corn. "'And I'll tell him you won't let the women come to the mills, you old nigger,' said Sambo. "'You just keep to your own row.' Tom was hungry with his day's journey, and almost faint for want of food. "'There, yo,' said Quimbo, throwing down a coarse bag which contained a peck of corn. "'There, nigger, grab. Take current. You won't get no more this yar week.' Tom waited till a late hour to get a place at the mills, and then, moved by the utter weariness of two women, whom he saw trying to grind their corn there, he ground for them put together the decaying brands of the fire, where many had baked cakes before them, and then went about getting his own supper. It was a new kind of work there, a deed of charity, small as it was, but it woke an answering touch in their hearts. An expression of womanly kindness came over their hard faces. They mixed his cake for him, and tended its baking. 
and Tom sat down by the light of the fire and drew out his Bible, for he had need for comfort. "'What's that?' said one of the women. "'A Bible,' said Tom. "'Good Lord! Hadn't seen him since I was in Kentuck.' "'Was you raised in Kentuck?' said Tom, with interest. "'Yes, and well raised, too. Never spect to come to dis yar,' said the woman, sighing. "'What's dat our book, anyway?' said the other woman. "'Why, the Bible.' "'Laws me, what's dat?' said the woman. "'Do tell! You never hearn't on't?' said the other woman. "'I used to hear Mrs. a-readin' on't sometimes in Kentuck, but laws o' me, we don't hear nothin' here but crackin' and swarin'. "'Read a piece, anyways,' said the first woman, curiously, seeing Tom attentively poring over it. Tom read, "'Come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest.' "'Them's good words enough,' said the woman. "'Who says em? "'The Lord,' said Tom. "'I just wish I knowed where to find him,' said the woman. "'I would go. "'Pears like I never should get rested again. "'My flesh is fairly sore, and I tremble all over every day, "'and Sambo's allers a-jawin' at me, "'cause I doesn't pick faster. "'And nights it's most midnight fore I can get my supper, "'and then pears like I don't turn over and shut my eyes fore I hear the horn blow to get up, and at it again in the morning. If I knew where the Lord was, I'd tell him. He's here. He's everywhere, said Tom. Lord, you ain't gwine to make me believe dat. I, I know the Lord aren't here, said the woman. Tain't no use talking, though. I's just gwine to camp down and sleep while I can. The women went off to their cabins, and Tom sat alone by the smoldering fire that flickered up redly in his face. The silver fair-browed moon rose in the purple sky and looked down, calm and silent, as God looks on the scene of misery and oppression, looked calmly on the lone black man as he sat with his arms folded and his Bible on his knee. Is God here? And how is it possible for the untaught heart to keep its faith, unswerving in the face of dire misrule and palpable unrebuked injustice? In that simple heart waged a fierce conflict, the crushing sense of wrong, the foreshadowing of a whole life of future misery, the wreck of all past hopes, mournfully tossing in the soul's sight, like dead corpses of wife and child and friend, rising from the dark wave, and surging in the face of the half-drowned mariner. Ah, was it easy here to believe and hold fast the great password of Christian faith that God is, and is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him? Tom rose disconsolate and stumbled into the cabin that had been allotted to him. The floor was already strewn with weary sleepers, and the foul air of the place almost repelled him. But the heavy night-dews were chill, and his limbs weary, and, wrapping about him a tattered blanket which formed his only bedclothing, he stretched himself in the straw and fell asleep. In dreams a gentle voice came over his ear. He was sitting on the mossy seat in the garden by Lake Pontchartrain, and Eva, with her serious eyes bent downward, was reading to him from the Bible, and he heard her read, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Saviour. Gradually the words seemed to melt and fade, as in a divine music. The child raised her deep eyes, and fixed them lovingly on him, and rays of warmth and comfort seemed to go from them to his heart, and, as if wafted on the music, she seemed to rise on shining wings, from which flakes and spangles of gold fell off like stars, and she was gone. Tom woke. Was it a dream? Let it pass for one. But who shall say that that sweet young spirit, which in life so yearned to comfort and console the distressed, was forbidden of God to assume this ministry after death? It is a beautiful belief that ever round our head are hovering on angel wings the spirits of the dead. End of chapter 32